Well, I'm, I'm continuing in, in uh, notes number five. Uh, we're on uh, the page 37, so it says in the upper right corner. Um, and we have examined the, uh, we've talked a lot about the Fourier transform recently. We've talked a lot about the, uh, last time we talked about the autocovariance and the autocorrelation. And now we're, we're kind of elaborating on that. Uh, we're talking about the cross covariance. So here it is defined in, uh, in integral form. And, and so the, uh, the cross covariance, okay, which is a function of lag tau, which is just another name for a time axis, is this integral over the entire, uh, uh, the entire range of t. And you can see what we've got here is uh, uh, we're integrating the product of one time series x conjugate, you know, the co the complex conjugate of one time series for all t against uh, a, a, another time series. That's why it's a cross covariance instead of an auto covariance. Another time series y, which is uh, in order, it's still in order of of time, but it's offset by this lag tau. Okay, so tau, you know, in this inside this integral, tau is a constant, and so uh, we we get that entire cross. You know, it's like an inner product, okay, an inner product of, of x uh, starting at t and uh, and y starting at t plus tau. Okay, so we have the two time series, and we get their inner product, and and uh, for a constant t, and that gives us the one complex number that is uh, their cross covariance um, at that value of, of the lag tau. Now notice that uh, you know only one of these gets its uh, um, gets its complex conjugate taken, uh, which is the first one that we call x in this equation. And so we have to say, you know what order are we doing the cross covariance in? And that's what this little x, y in parentheses as a superscript means. It's not a uh, it's not a power or anything like that. It's not an exponent. Uh, so here's you know just just for your your reference is the definition of the cross covariance in the other direction. Okay, and you can see the how the notation is for that. And so we take the complex conjugate of y and we uh, multiply that by the lagged x. Okay, and so that is an inner product then, and and this inner product these uh, Angle brackets are are kind of my shorthand notation for an inner product uh, of these two uh, of these two uh, time series. You know, one of them lagged. Uh, so so clearly, uh, for complex signals, this cross covariance, um, and I still had auto covariance on the mind when I wrote this down. The cross covariance does not commute. Okay, so um, uh, if you uh, if you look at the definition for c of y x, okay, what you'll actually come up with if you look at how it's defined, okay, and and take a uh, uh, you know here I'm using the dummy variable q as the as the time the time axis that I'm integrating along, okay, and there's that that constant tau, so so uh, you can compose it this way and you see that the um, um, uh, the y of c, the, the c of y x is equal to uh, the cross covariance of x y, okay, and uh, different in that it's on the negative tau, okay, so you have a negative lag, and that's that you can see from here, and it and it's the complex conjugate of that. So, so you know these are uh, 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 kind of conjugate symmetric. Okay, the cross covariance of of x y is kind of the con is conjugate symmetric uh, and symmetric about uh, you know zero lag, okay, zero tau, um, and uh, so the uh, uh, you know on the positive tau axis, uh, c of x y is the uh, 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 <clears throat> is the uh, uh, the 
complex conjugate of c of y x on the negative tau negative side of the tau axis. Okay, so uh, a, a nice symmetry there, but uh, you know you have to bear in mind that that when uh, x or y are uh, uh, when either one can be complex, you know might have a non-zero uh, a non-zero imaginary part, then you have to uh, realize it's not commutative. Okay, now uh, if we take that cross covariance and we normalize it, remember how we normalized the uh, auto covariance into an auto correlation, okay, and we normalized it by the auto correlation at uh, zero, all right, and we can do the same thing even though we have two inputs to the to the cross uh, covariance, right? So we have uh, x and y, and of course x has a uh, uh, has an autocorrelation, and the time series y has an autocorrelation, and we can look at those autocorrelations at lag zero, and we use the uh, geometric mean of the two of those, okay, which is basically just taking you know r at zero of uh, of x and times r at zero of y, and uh, taking the square root of that product, and we use that to normalize the uh, uh, the the cross. Uh, uh, the cross covariance into a cross correlation, which I am now calling c hat. All right, so that's all we're doing, uh, and that's uh, the formal definition of the cross correlation. You will hear me slip into uh, talking. Uh, I'll give you the term cross correlation when I really mean the cross covariance, and that's just the inexactness of my own uh, my own uh, uh, brain, I guess, uh, my own language. Um, you have no doubt heard about the coefficient of correlation, and for you know any length of time series, uh, or really any any data set for which you can define an inner product, uh, here it is. Uh, and you might notice that uh, uh, the cross um, the cross uh, uh, the cross covariance at uh, lag zero, okay. The cross covariance at lag zero is just the inner product of x against y, okay. And I hope it's clear to you um, how how you compute that inner product. You know, I always go back to these uh, uh, memory uh, box diagrams that uh, that I'm I'm constantly um, that I'm constantly uh, putting out. So here's uh, an example of calculating an inner product at a particular lag. Uh, actually, this one is at zero lag, right? So it's uh, um, uh, x hat x uh, conjugate at zero times x conjugate and uh, times x at zero. It's x conjugate at one times x at one. You know, so that's an inner product of x with itself at zero lag, is what's being illustrated there. Um, so uh, uh, if I just give you the inner product of x and y, that's obviously the the cross correlation, the cross covariance at zero lag. Okay. So here we have the uh, the the co this this coefficient of correlation. You know the cross correlation, right? Uh, you can compute that at any lag tau. All right. And so it's a time series itself. Okay, the cross covariance is a time series. The cross correlation is a time series. Auto correlation, auto covariance is a time series. Those are all time series. Uh, but this coefficient of correlation is the cross correlation at zero lag. Okay, so it's just one number, and it's a um, uh, could be a, a complex number, um, but. Uh, um, uh, but but it's uh, uh, it's just one number, and it's the zero lag uh, cross covariance normalized by the uh, zero lag auto covariances. Okay, you know x dotted with itself and y dotted with itself. Okay, so it's uh, it's one number. Uh, so the cross correlation at zero lag is the coefficient of correlation. 
Uh, and if you uh, look at that, you'll see that it ties into the, uh, the coefficients of correlation that you've heard about. All right. So for uh, now, now here's some warnings. You know, coefficients of correlation are cited in many papers and many textbooks. And here's Clairbout's warning about the, the use of the coefficient of correlation. And uh, this, for instance, is why uh, one of the reasons why, uh, say, John Anderson developed a whole scheme for using no fewer than a hundred different assessments of the similarity between, say, a model and a synthetic seismogram. Okay, um, so you can you can rate uh, something as as simple as seismograms and their synthetics. You know, how do you compare them? Well, there's a lot of papers from the early days of, of seismogram modeling that just put out a coefficient of correlation. Okay, and and if it was over 50 percent, you know, it looked pretty good. Okay, um, and uh, here's Clairbout's warning. Okay, um, you take a, an arbitrary, uh, say, a randomly generated cosine wave, and you 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 uh, take another arbitrary, randomly generated cosine wave, you know, random, uh, random frequency, random, um, random amplitude, uh, random phase, all right? And you take their, you calculate their coefficients of correlation, all right? Two thirds of the time, all right, the coefficient of correlation is greater than 0.5, greater than 50%. Half of the time, the coefficient of correlation is uh, greater than seventy-one percent. Okay, and, and and you know the input to this experiment was uh, uh, was you know completely random cosine waves. All right, so so uh, you know the data just because you get a coefficient of correlation that's greater than seventy percent, that doesn't mean that that they're really significantly correlated. All right, and you certainly don't don't want to uh, make any uh, causal um, causality inferences from these coefficients of correlation, and, and and it really points the the way to you know you have particular data, particular synthetics, they you know they have some overlap in their in their frequency band, they have some overlap in their in their amplitude range. Um, some overlap in in their uh, length and that sort of thing, um, you know. You really have to assess the statistics of your of your data set and 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 your synthetics that you're comparing them against before you 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 can uh, uh, you can make any broad pronouncements about what a particular coefficient of correlation means. So you know there are cases where uh, uh, things work out right and maybe even a you know for some data sets a coefficient of correlation. Of fifty percent could be significant, okay. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, Clairbout's warning here is uh, pretty valid for seismograms because a lot of our seismograms are fairly band limited, and uh, they look kind of like cosine waves. So uh, you know, just in that case, because you're getting a high coefficient of correlation, um, is really can be pretty meaningless, you know, and you you have to test and, and assess and decide yourself, you know, what a significant co coefficient of correlation is going to be. Okay, uh, it could be it could be 0. 0.5, it could be 0. 0.9999. Okay, it could be a 5.9 kind of uh, kind of coefficient of correlation that you need to to actually uh, indicate something important. You've got to assess that. Um, and I hope uh, in the future, when you guys review uh, papers that others have, have put in, um, you know, for journals and, and for funding agencies, um, when you review the work of your uh, of your colleagues, your uh, your coworkers, uh, that you'll pay attention to this issue and and not let anybody get away with with a simple statement, you know, simple broad statement of what's what's significant correlation. Okay. Um, and there's, you know, there's a vast literature to back you up on that uh, in making those uh, those reviews, uh, you know, such as uh, Anderson's paper of several years ago on, um, uh, really just a few years ago on, on you know all the all the different ways of comparing seismograms. 
Okay. Um, now there's other other ways we use the cross correlation. For instance, uh, you know we take uh, little uh, uh, snippets of waves, uh, synthetics ge generated from uh, well logs, and we we correlate them against our uh, our data, and uh, we uh, we say, all right, uh, you know this interface in this well log is going to match this data set, where we find that that uh, maximum correlation. All right. Um, now we are implying that there's that the correlation is significant at that maximum, but really what we're doing is we're taking the, you know, how the correlation changes it. You know, we calculate a, a coefficient of correlation effectively for different lags is what it really is, and uh, uh, and we identify a uh, a match. You know, at a particular travel time, say with a particular depth in the well. Uh, when we see that that coefficient of correlation reach a maximum, so there the question is not really what's the amplitude of the coefficient of correlation. The uh, the question really is, you know, how how well can we uh, can we identify that match time, you know, from the peak? How broad is the peak in the coefficient of correlation? And that that's a that's a, a different question again. Okay, now in the uh, frequency domain, okay, as you as you might imagine from our, our work with the uh, uh, with the auto covariance, okay, the cross covariance in the frequency domain c of omega is now x conjugate of omega times y conjugate. Uh, I'm sorry, times y of of omega. Okay, so we're still taking the complex conjugate of x, but we we transform it uh, to the uh, uh, to the omega domain, and uh, uh, with a Fourier transform. So this is the the Fourier transform of x. Capital Y is the Fourier transform of y, and and we get the uh, uh, the cross covariance just by multiplying out these two complex numbers at every frequency omega that, that we're interested in. And so uh, that takes uh, you know if we have n samples in our in our time series and n samples in our in our uh, frequency um, in our Fourier transform series. Okay, then this operation here, calculating the cross power spectrum, as as this could be called. Okay, this is only going to take um, n operations. Okay, you know one one uh, complex uh, multiplication per uh, uh, per frequency. Sample, all right. And uh, on the other hand, as you can see from from this inner product, or or uh, thinking back to the uh, auto covariance, uh, and also from the uh, uh, from the integral here, you can see that that computing the whole cross covariance for you know and and coming out with a uh, uh, a cross covariance uh, in terms of tau, where you have n samples of, of tau, right? So you get the whole time series. The input time series are length n. Uh, if we Fourier transform them, the Fourier transforms have length n. And also our cross covariance uh, time series in tau have length n. Okay, this, this, uh, this whole process to get that whole cross covariance series is going to take uh, n squared samples, right? And so, if we have a long, um, if we have a very long time series, or a couple of very long time series, then it's very much worth our while to short circuit the uh, that n squared uh, uh, effort and use our uh, n log to the base two n effort to do a uh, uh, a Fourier transform and then another n multiplications to get the uh, uh, the cross covariance in the frequency domain, and then uh, even that is not so. It's not so bad to use n log to the base two n to uh, to take our uh, uh, to take our, our uh, cross covariance back into the the time domain, the tau domain. Okay, so uh, you know now we have a, a an easier way since we. Uh, went through the fast Fourier transform and saw how it was invented. We have a faster way of getting the cross covariance as well as the auto covariance. 
Uh, many things you've heard of. Here's their formal uh, definitions uh, in terms of the cross covariance. Uh, the coherency, okay, uh, is uh, in the frequency domain, and uh, so we call it c hat of uh, omega, and uh, that is the uh, the cross covariance, uh, the the Fourier transform of the cross covariance, okay. Uh, uh, and it's a whole series of different uh, values of omega, and it's the uh, the magnitude of of x uh, of omega at the same frequency. Div uh, it's divided by it's normalized by the absolute value or well the magnitude of x at that frequency, uh, and also by the magnitude of y at that frequency. So that gives you a coherency at every different frequency. And you've probably seen that measure you used and talked about before too. You know what's a, a time series that's coherent uh, has a has a high coherency at one frequency. You know we'll have a, a probably a lower coherency at a different frequency. You know, and that's uh, that's what we're looking at here. Uh, this is the the, the co spectrum is the real part. Okay, c sub r is just the real part of the. Um, of the Fourier transform of the uh, cross covariance, uh, and then there is the uh, the imaginary part, which has this interesting um, uh, term applied to it called quadrature. All right, so the imaginary part can be very significant as well, and it's it's uh, used uh, very well in uh, electrical uh, geophysics. Okay. Uh, the quadrature spectrum is just the imaginary part of the um, Fourier transform of the uh, cross covariance. Um, and the coherence, as opposed to the coherency, okay, is the square of the magnitude of the, uh, of the Fourier transform of the cross covariance. All right? So that's uh, it's. You can see it's not normalized, but it's uh, uh, it's basically squared. Okay. Um, so uh, you might call this a coherence spectrum if you want, or a coherence amplitude spectrum. Likewise, you can make a coherence phase spectra, um, which I might uh, you know phase is this is a, supposed to be a capital Greek letter omega there, uh, and it's uh, of course it's it's a spectrum, so it's uh, um, it's a it's a frequency series. It's got a different uh, uh, sample uh, at every different frequency. Um, okay, the coherence is real. The um, the coherency could be the coherency certainly could be uh, uh, complex. Okay, uh, the coherence is real. The uh, the the coherence phase. Is real as well because it's the inverse tangent of the imaginary part of the um, cross covariance uh, Fourier transform over the real part of the Fourier transform of the cross covariance. Um, and you can also uh, work through the definition of the tangent uh, and and see that it's the uh, uh, it's the uh, the imaginary part of the cross covariance over the um, the uh, uh, real part. Should all those c omegas have hats on? Uh, no, because the the uh, no, because they're unnormalized. So they just they just take this definition oh, here. Okay. Yeah, the 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 cross power spectrum, if you like. But really, I'd rather not call this a spectrum because it's uh, it's really a Fourier transformed um, cross covariance. It's the Fourier, you know, C itself is the Fourier transform of the cross covariance. Now, whether you calculate, you know, here you calculate it directly from the Fourier transforms of the two uh, of the two uh, uh, time series. Uh, but you could also do the integral and uh, in time and calculate the uh, the cross covariance relative to tau, and and then uh, and then you would uh, you could Fourier transform that, and and you'd have c of omega. 
All right. Here's a little uh, little example of, of how in reflection seismology we we use the uh, cross correlation as it uh, uh, or maybe as I say I say cross correlation but uh, I probably mean cross covariance. Let's see. So we have our um, our mechanical vibrosized source which is going to uh, use. Um, a hydraulic amplifier to react a four-ton mass against the ground. We can put any um, um, any signal into that. Uh, um, these, uh, you know, the hydraulic system, the hydraulic amplifiers tend to be uh, very, very good at. Um, uh, they tend to be very good at reproducing more or less sinusoidal functions. You know, it's it's really hard to get a mechanical device to do a spike. You know, um, uh, so they're they're much better at uh, at doing things that are like uh, um, well. Also, you can't um, uh, unless you had a, a you know a uh, hundred meters of rail for the uh, for the reaction mass to uh, uh, to be accelerated against. Uh, you know, you can't make a you can't make a uh, uh, a constant force, either. Okay, so so you've got to you've got to uh, to have the minimum amount of deflection of the reaction mass. You've got to have, you know, pretty much uh, sinusoidal oscillation. Okay, and that's uh, that's how these virus size machines work. Um, so so uh, you know we want to put a, essentially a sinusoidal type of uh, uh, type of source into the ground, so the force on the ground is going to be sinusoidal, and then down in the ground there's all these uh, impulses, which are the the reflection coefficients of the interfaces at various depths. Okay, and each one of those is going to send back a uh, a reflection, um, you know, which is uh, uh, basically a duplicate of the source wavelet. Uh, but uh, you know, times some reflection coefficient, which can be positive or negative. Usually, it's about one to five percent. So it's like a, a small, possibly phase reversed or, or uh, negative version of the uh, uh, of the source wavelet. Okay, and and the time that it comes back is is this t sub i, which is the uh, two way travel time of the of the reflection. So in you know basin scale, um, uh, you know. Uh, 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 you know, oil exploration. That's going to be uh, one to four seconds uh, for the uh, uh, for the reflection time, and the reflection coefficient of that reflector i number i is uh, uh, is a sub i as I and it could be between uh, you know minus. Uh, Five percent up to uh, maybe uh, five percent in the near surface. Uh, you know, say at the water table or the bottom of the alluvium, we can see reflection coefficients occasionally as high as uh, fifty percent. Um, one thing you you may uh, not quite realize is that the reflection coefficient of waves coming up to the surface of the Earth is a perfect minus one. Okay, so that's. Uh, 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 you have a perfect mirror at the surface of the Earth too, at the free surface. All right, so we have this time series, which is a bunch of spikes uh, that is that are these different heights and different uh, different lags, uh, and we convolve the uh, uh, you know the Earth then convolves the uh, vibrosized source uh, with this and produces our output reflection seismogram. Now I, I'm ignoring here. Um, you know all of the source-generated noise, the surface waves, the air waves, um, the nonlinearity of uh, of the propagation of of um, you know very strong uh, waves being induced right under the vibrosized machine. Um, I'm ignoring the uh, um, the uh, directional um, sensitivity of our of our uh, uh, of our geophone arrays and our and our vibrator source arrays, you know, all that uh, are are not in this model. This is the the simplest possible model for reflection data. Uh, I'm in, I'm ignoring a lot of geometric aspects that we'll get to um, 
and saying, uh, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is a zero offset seismogram. This is what you get when you use uh, Graham's chirp device in a lake. Uh, it sends out uh, again. It's very the, the chirp uh, fish is uh, is much uh, much better at at sending down a, a sinusoidal pressure pulse uh, than a uh, a sudden um, uh, impulse like a sparker uh, is. So it's uh, the chirp device is able to get a lot more energy into the into the water uh, as uh, sinusoidal types of uh, of oscillation. Um, and we're only looking directly below the, the fish, and we have uh, you know basically no more than one meter distance between the uh, the, the source transducer and the, the receiver transducer. So uh, very simple zero offset uh, seismo uh, exploration seismology here, and and we're going to talk a lot more about these geometries in the second half of the class. Um, so don't worry about about that. Um, but uh, you know, here we have an extremely simple uh, model. You know, it's a convolutional filter uh, physical do physical uh, model for the. Uh, it's not a statistical model; it's a physical model for the uh, uh, reflection seismogram. So the, the seismogram y of t is equal to the sum over all the different reflectors of the reflection coefficient, scaling the uh, the source wavelet. Um, which has been delayed by the uh, the reflection, the two-way travel time of the to the reflector. Okay, so um, uh, let's suppose we take uh, y and we cross correlate that or cross covariance process it. Uh, we cross correlate it with uh, uh, the, the the data y against the source wavelength. All right. Uh, you know, in our vibrator machine, um, we don't actually start surveying until the accelerometer on the on the on the plate that's held down by the, the weight of the total weight of the vibrator against the ground. You know, if that if that uh, if that plate accelerometer is not working and we can't record data from it, okay, then uh, we can't you know we can't conduct the survey. And this is why, because in the uh, recording truck. Okay, they're going to, or maybe later, you know, when we process the data in a computer, uh, we're gonna we're gonna do this uh, cross correlation of the uh, of the source wavelet against the uh, uh, against the data from each geophone. Okay, and and back when uh, computers were relatively incapable and expensive, uh, there were special correlator boxes built to uh, to handle this cross correlation. Um, on the fly, and uh, that correlator box was was surely uh, well, it cost as much as a whole vibrator, so it was uh, you know over a hundred thousand dollars. So it was one of the most ex expensive pieces of equipment out there, and it was pretty difficult to do a uh, um, to do a, a vibrosized survey without a correlator box. Uh, although it's it's actually better not to correlate. Uh, you know, you, you want to correlate on the fly so you can look at the results, uh, but uh, you um, you also you also want to um, um, you also want to make sure you save all the uncorrelated data because uh, if you correlate it wrong and you have or say you had the wrong uh, source wavelet or or the uh, the 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 accelerometer on the vibra vibra vibrator plate has gone off, you know, and is giving you uh, uh, the wrong seismogram itself. Uh, then uh, you can you can correct all that if you have if you have the uh, the actual uh, recorded data. Okay, but we do uh, eventually pass it through a, cor a cross correlation like this, so we get a cross correlated time series out. It's just relative to lag tau. Uh, and it's a it's the cross correlation of of the source wavelet against the uh, the geophone recording, and and you can see that what this is now is uh, uh, it's you can factor things out right because here's the definition of y right so uh, and and y y has these delta functions in it so you can kind of bring those out and what you've got is um, uh, you have the sum 
of of all of the um, uh, all of the reflection coefficients, you know, times this uh, uh, this integral here. Would you you should recognize this integral as the autocorrelation of s, the autocorrelation of the source. Okay, so here it is. Uh, R sub s is the autocorrelation of the source, and it's at uh, you know getting rid of the dummy variable t here, and just leaving you know it's the it's uh, autocorrelation of the source at uh, uh, the lag tau minus the reflection time t sub i. Okay, and and now we're getting closer here. What we what we would like is to be able to take y and kind of deconvolve it, and just get back this. This series of spikes, right? That would be incredibly useful if we could just have those spikes back, um, because then that's that's going to give us the you know we'll we'll be able to look at each spike and each spike will 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 be have a height in proportion to the reflection coefficient and a delay in proportion to you know in a delay that helps us identify the two-way travel time. Okay, so all right here. These uh, we've got almost the same thing, except instead of a delta function, we've got the autocorrelation of the source wavelet. All right, and and if that was simple enough, then our job is easy. Okay, and so uh, that's what the that, that was the secret behind the vibrosize patent and the vibrosize source, is that uh, they found a source that has an autocorrelation that is. That is more like a spike than anything else. That, uh, of course, the source couldn't be a spike itself. The source had to be a pretty long, drawn-out um, uh, sinusoidal type type thing, just to mechanically work the vibrator um, and be able to to you know work through the uh, uh, the the. Uh, it's kind of amazing uh, how they how they built these uh, you know hydro hydro mechanical. Uh, um, you know, amplifier loops. Uh, you know, in out of uh, uh, out of valves and hoses. You know, a pretty amazing system. Um, but uh, uh, you know, they found a a source wavelet that has a very you know a pretty co compact and spiky um, autocorrelation. All right, and the autocorrelation looks like this. Uh, it looks a little bit like a like a sink function. And uh, you know you can measure the height of that central peak, and you can find the uh, uh, you can find the the time at the uh, um, at the center of it. Okay, and and before that, you know we'd always been looking for uh, you know when we were using explosions and sparkers for our uh, our seismic sources, we were always looking for that first little deflection, you know from from no amplitude. Okay. And uh, you know that's a hard business. We got a lot of we got a lot of uh, noise and interference from other reflections, interference from other phases. That that first deflection might be pretty much invisible. But but if you're measuring the the largest part of the wavelet, and you're just trying to get the center of it, that becomes much much more practical. And that's another reason why the vibrosize was a successful technique. Chirp is more successful than sparkers um, because. Uh, you know, we're using the highest energy, the largest part of the wavelet, as as the basis of measurement. Okay, so uh, uh, and and this autocorrelation, this R sub s, you know, is is perfectly symmetrical about uh, about the, uh, uh, the the zero time. So uh, uh, you know, we measure our our t sub i's, our our uh, we measure our um, our, our reflection times, you know, right from the middle here, and it's in the biggest part of the wavelet, so it's it's easy as easy as it's going to get to measure. Okay, so uh, many reasons for the success of the vibrosize technique, and that's one of them. Um, okay, so we have uh, then the source wavelet that has this you know beautiful compact spiky uh, autocorrelation is uh, uh, is called a chirp. Okay, and um, and I should say compactness of autocorrelation. The chirp can be as long as you want. In fact, the longer the better. The longer and the broader the band of the chirp, uh, the uh, uh, 
um, the more compact and spiky your autocorrelation is going to be. Okay, so uh, that's why. Let's see. I was specifying um, the survey that's starting on the on that Optum is starting on the uh, on the test site uh, this week. Um, they've brought in S wave vibrators, uh, which is kind of a, a you know they're very expensive. Um, and at each uh, each of the source points, they're gonna they're gonna activate four times, and they're going to vibrate for a chirp that is uh, is six seconds long, and I think they're gonna have a uh, what is it gonna be eight to a hundred hertz uh, is gonna be the frequency range of the chirp, right? So here's um, uh, here's the uh, uh, the sinusoid that you use. Um, but uh, uh, that uh, that chirp is going to go on for six seconds, even though the uh, uh, we're only interested in four seconds of, uh, of of what we call listen time. You know, we're only going to we're only looking for reflectors reflection times t sub i's down to uh, a maximum of four of four seconds. Okay, uh, what we're trying to do actually is uh, sound out the uh, the cavity and rubble chimney from a uh, 1970s, I think, uh, nuclear explosion uh, up on uh, Pahut Mesa. Uh, so one of the first, uh, you know, actual reflection experiments done over a uh, an actual nuclear blast. Um, um, last spring. No, no, no. That was at uh, this. Yeah, this is. Uh, Kind of uh, 100 kilometers northeast of, of Beatty, Nevada, southern Nevada, and um, yeah, the um, we might try characterizing what was the name of that of that blast. Um, yeah, I don't either. Uh, but the one east of Fallon, which is totally accessible, uh, unlike the one on the test site, um, that's a much deeper uh, blast, um, and. Uh, uh, and I didn't see any ground disturbance there, uh, but a lot of these blasts in Pahut Mesa they were larger, they were not as deep, and uh, instead of being in the competent granite of the one east of Fallon, they were in uh, kind of mixed. Um, you know, they were in the volcanic uh, section, the thick rhyolites, which are pretty strong, but still not as strong as, as solid granite. So uh, uh, there's a real danger. Um, you know, even even 40 years later after the blast that. If you send heavy equipment out right over the, the chimney, you could get another collapse, which of course is extremely dangerous, aside from releasing radiation, perhaps. Um, that obviously hasn't happened uh, east of Fallon, and it probably won't. Um, but uh, uh, if you look at Google Earth uh, uh, up at Pahut Mesa, you'll see some craters there. Uh, now, this, this particular one. Um, has not collapsed to the surface, but it's probably collapsed uh, within 200 meters of the surface, uh, and that's what we're trying to—that's what we're trying to figure out. You know, how far? Where can we identify the chimney? Can we locate the chimney? So even though we're we're only you know we're getting a max you know a maximum reflection time of, of four seconds, we're we're putting in six seconds worth of energy for every vibrator activation, okay? And that's really what costs money, okay? Because that means we can only do, you know, four times six seconds. So we're going to have at least twenty-four seconds um, per uh, uh, per source point, and there's going to be uh, more than a hundred source points. So um, uh, and then there's, you know, actually that's more time than it takes to drive from one source point to the next for the vibrator. So uh, it's uh, uh, you know the length of the chirp and the need to have a long enough chirp. Um, that has enough waves in it that uh, uh, to make a you know a compact enough um, uh, autocorrelation, okay, a spiky enough autocorrelation, that drives the cost of the whole thing. That's why we and that's why we we even for well we'll do a hundred source points maybe uh, three times uh, on three different survey routes at that experiment. So um, we're actually going to. Um, um, we're we're actually going to uh, um, it's going to take us a week, okay? If we could cut it to a, a one second um, chirp, we would, 
but we're, we're worried that wouldn't penetrate down to the 800 meters that the bottom of the cavity is, okay? Um, and it would take, you know, it would take basically half the time if we had one second of, uh, uh, it would take us, you know, half a week only instead of uh, a full week, and that would save probably um, sixty thousand dollars on the on the vibrator rental. Uh, but we can't because we need all that. We need all that time. We need that whole six seconds. Um, okay, so you uh, you take the sinusoid, and and here's the uh, uh, here's the frequency omega, which is the the uh, uh, derivative, the time derivative of the uh, um, of, of the argument of the sine function, and so uh, you find that uh, you know you start at uh, at some omega zero, which uh, um, you know would be two pi times uh, I think eight hertz for us uh, at NTS this week, and uh, and then you add uh, uh, some rate of uh, a frequency increase, right? You have this scale factor alpha, which says how how fast you uh, um, you increase your frequency. And we've scaled, you know, we've we've made the alpha appropriate to six sec after six seconds, we're up at uh, at a at at our high frequency of 100 hertz. Okay, so that's how uh, that's how you set up the uh, the sweep. And um, uh, and this nice broadband sweep is going to have a very compact uh, autocorrelation. Uh, another way of expressing this is how much energy you put in uh, versus uh, uh, versus uh, frequency, and um, and which also turns out to be versus time. And and you can see here that uh, you know basically uh, uh, we're we're putting in a, a band uh, that is uh, pretty limited. Um, and, and we're not putting it at higher frequencies. We're not putting it at lower frequencies. Uh, but the broader this band, okay, um, you know, the the higher the the sweep uh, uh, band, uh, the larger the sweep, uh, the wider the sweep band, then the uh, more com compact the uh, um, the autocorrelation is going to be. Um, rule of thumb. Um, you you got to have for viber size work. You've got to have at least a uh, two octave, um, uh, a two octave uh, band. And uh, um, so if we start at eight hertz, you know, going to sixteen hertz would be one octave. Going to thirty two hertz would be another octave. So you got to go. Ha got to have a sweep that's at least eight to uh, thirty two hertz. And uh, three or four octaves is much better. So uh, what do we got? Uh, 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 one octave to uh, 16, 32, 64, uh, and if we went all the way to uh, so we got we got up to 100, uh, we're going about three and a half octaves. So that's going to be a nice compact sweep. Without uh, you know the 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 less broadband your sweep, the larger these side lobes are on the autocorrelation, uh, and 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 thus the the less definite this center peak is. Okay. Let me just give you a slight introduction to our next section, which is uh, notes number six. And um, uh, we're going to learn how to filter in the Z plane. Okay. So we're going to take what we've uh, what we've learned um, uh, about Z transforms. Um, up to now, you know, I've really, I've really given you a lot of what I want to give you about the one-dimensional Fourier transform, the fast Fourier transform, the um, and uh, uh, these these sort of principal signal analysis tools, uh, the uh, auto covariance, the cross covariance, and all of their kind of you know derivative products, and um, so we're entering another another major section here. Um, where we're going to, uh, uh, I don't know if you've seen specifications for um, like the response of, uh, of stations or the response of filters, uh, and you see them written down as, as poles and zeros with, uh, uh, you know, giving complex numbers for each pole and zero, they'll give you a complex number. And it's uh, generally uh, uh, 
you know, the magnitude of these complex numbers is pretty close to one, okay, if you've noticed. And so we're going to find out how to describe time series and, uh, and filters in this way um, in terms of, of some complex numbers that are close to one and, uh, and poles and zeros. So we'll start uh, by thinking about filters and filtering and uh, what you can do with different types of filters. And, and then uh, we'll represent those in the, uh, the z-plane. In fact, we'll, we'll start out right away uh, with this, uh, this very simple filter here, which um, uh, I don't know if it's worth going into uh, uh, the right, uh, right mode right now, but uh, I'm compelled to do it for some reason. Um, all right, so we have uh, uh, this very simple filter time series, 1 followed by minus 1. And zero everywhere else, okay. And this, uh, you know, according what's the z transform of this filter? Well, it's just one minus z, right? Uh, the the uh, the sample one is at zero time. The sample minus one is at delta t or one times delta t, okay. Um, now let's let's take a uh, let's take a constant time series, okay. And that's going to have a z transform that has all of these components, and they're all they all have equal um, equal arguments, right? Uh, there's a one in front of every co coefficient of, uh, of every coefficient of, of the different powers of z is one. All right, so that's a uh, um, you know you can you can uh, you know maybe you can write uh, uh, ten or twenty of them. And then when you multiply, so that's a polynomial. Maybe you'll have twenty terms, and you multiply um, um, you multiply that polynomial against this other polynomial, which is the the filter z transform. And you'll find that basically most of the components you get are zero. You know, if if you start at uh, z to the zeroth power for this uh, constant polynomial, and you end it at z to the twentieth, then around z to the Zero and z to the twentieth, you're going to have non-zero coefficients. But uh, otherwise, all the all the intermediate coefficients where the function is really constant are going to be zero. All right. And I want you guys to think about before uh, tomorrow. Think about what this means. Right. This this particular z polynomial is a constant time series. You know, one, 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 one. That's that's all it is. And we're convolving it with this multiplication here in z. We're convolving it with this time series one minus one. So a convolution, of course, means we are taking this this uh, this constant time series and we're filtering it by one minus one. Okay, we're filtering it by the time series one minus one. Now, now if you take a constant function, okay, f of t is equal to one always. And you take its time derivative, you're going to get zero. And uh, uh, and if you think about, uh, say, the concept of finite differences, then you'll realize, oh, this filter here is a differentiator. You convolve that with a constant with a series, and you're taking the time derivative of that time series. Okay, so that's uh, um, that's uh, 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 something that uh, we'll start with. Uh, tomorrow at eleven, and um, uh, so uh, think about uh, what kind of filter this this filter time series is, and uh, what the implication is of having this particular z transform for that filter. Okay.